All right, so here's a problem I would like to talk about today. So we have this bicycle, and I've, I, have, I, didn't drive, I didn't draw the rider on it because I'm not very good at drawing people. But nonetheless, the bicycle is moving forward at a speed or velocity v in the i-hat direction. And furthermore, I want to say that that v dot is bigger than zero, meaning that this bicycle is speeding up as it's going along, okay? So it's accelerating to the right. Now, as this bicycle is cruising along, let's suppose that the two wheels are rolling without slipping on the pavement. What does that mean? That means at this point where the, where the wheel is in contact with the ground, there is or there may be a friction force preventing the wheel from sliding. And my question is, which direction does that friction force act, assuming there is one? This is the force from the ground, friction force from the ground acting on the wheel. Does it push forward? Or does it push backward? And similar, similarly, there is a uh, friction force on the rear wheel too, at least potentially. And I want to know the direction in which that friction force acts. All right, so here's my question. I'll restate it. In which direction does the friction force from the ground act on the wheels? I want you to answer each one of them separately. And I'm going to suggest you start with the front wheel, and then we can go to the back wheel. We'll assume there's no friction in the bearings. We can get rid of any aerodynamic forces as well. Now, as you answer this question, I do not want you to give me a response that's based upon your gut instinct. In other words, how you believe things work here. Right? Get rid of the belief system right now. What I want you to do is form an argument based on physical principles. What do I mean by that? Well, we have the physical principles. We'll look at the top one. Of course, these are equations, but these equations really have meaning in it. So the top one here says that the sum of the external forces equals mass times the acceleration of the center of mass on a body. Or really, this, is, this first one works for any collection of particles, right? So this, this bicycle is a collection of parts, each with mass. So if I add up all the external forces on this thing, that should equal the mass times the acceleration of not just any point on this body, but the, the acceleration of the center of mass, right? And similar, similarly, there are sort of moment relationships, so rotational relationships. So the most general one is expressed by this thing right here. Um, we might not get to this one, right? in this problem, but, but there's ways to simplify this. So you can take, this only works for a single rigid body uh, moving in a plane here. So let me just go down here. So this third one really works if we have a body for which P is fixed in space, it's not moving. So if that's the case, then the moments about that fixed point P would equal to the moment of inertia about point P times the angular acceleration. So the rate at which angular velocity is changing would be proportional to the net moment, right? The last one is one where we can talk about moments about the center of mass of an object. So G is the center of mass. So the moments about the center of mass cause an acceleration, angular acceleration for the body. So it's these physical principles on the right, upper right corner here that I want you to use to base an argument on, to answer this question, right? Not your gut instinct, physical principles. What I want you to do right now is pause the video, think about it, construct your argument, do it for the front wheel, right? Start with the front wheel. Once you have the front wheel done, then you can unpause again. We'll talk about the front wheel and we'll do it again for the back, okay? So pause here, try to answer the question for the front wheel, come back when you are ready. All right, so let's answer this. We're thinking about the front wheel, right? Which way does friction act on the front wheel? So even though we're asking a qualitative question, I want you to think about it in terms of the usual, usual sort of ways we've been approaching problem solving in this class. Right, we're gonna start with a free body diagram of the wheel. So what are the forces acting on the wheel? Well, as usual, we have gravity pulling down on the wheel. And just like in statics, we put the force of gravity acting at the center of gravity of the body, which is, which is coincident with the center of mass, which is coincident with the center of the wheel, right? This is a balanced wheel. And I'll label that weight force W. What other forces do we have? Well, we have forces due to the road, right? Forces are things that are pushing and pulling on this object. So the, certainly the road's pushing and pulling and tugging and 
whatever it's doing. So for one, there's this normal force keeping the, the wheel from penetrating through the ground, like so. And then there's also the friction force. The friction force is the thing we're interested in, right? So can't forget that. And the friction force acts, you know, tangent to the surface here, right? Tangent to the ground. But we don't know which direction it acts in. So let me just, I don't know, maybe I should put a double arrowed sort of vector right here. We kind of don't know which way this thing goes. I'll call this... I'll call this F, F for friction force on the front wheel. So that's, that's the most important force we're after here. How's that? Done with all the forces? I'd argue there's one more, or at least one more. Do you see it? Forces are things that are pushing and pulling on the object, in this case, the wheel. Forces come through direct contact. Right? So is there something contacting the wheel that's providing a force? I'm hoping you see that the fork, right? The fork on the bicycle, this piece, this piece right up here, it's pushing on the wheel, right? It's actually it's pushing down on the wheel and maybe pushing forward on the wheel a bit too. So yeah, there is a force from the fork. We'll say pushing on this front wheel. And a fork starts with an F. I already called the friction F. I'll just call this D just to just to have a name for it. But there's that there's the force from the fork. And I think those are all our forces. And these are forces on the free body diagram. So let me just label that real quick. Okay, so now that I have a free body diagram, the next thing I want to do is uh, draw a mass acceleration diagram, just as I've done all semester long. So let's go for it. Again, we're th when we're drawing this mass acceleration diagram, we're thinking in terms of principles, right? What we have on the left-hand side are all the forces acting on the object. On the right-hand side, the mass acceleration diagram, we should have mass times acceleration. So we're essentially looking at this, right? And when I draw that acceleration, it's not the accelerate. Remember, it's not the acceleration just any arbitrary point on the body. It's the acceleration at the center of mass. And what's the center of mass doing? The center of mass is the center of the wheel. The wheel is attached to the fork. The fork is attached to the frame. The fork and the frame are all moving directly to the right with the speed v. In fact, that speed v is increasing, right? So we've got an acceleration to the right. So the center of mass, that center of the wheel, has to have an acceleration which is horizontal directly to the right like so. So again, what does this principle tell us? It tells us that all these forces over here on the left-hand side, on the, on the free body diagram, have to add up to this mass times the acceleration. Notice ex mass times acceleration is all horizontal, so this means that all the vertical forces, or I should say all the vertical components of these forces, have to add up to zero. And then all the horizontal components have to add up to this mass times acceleration. Specifically, it means that the horizontal component of the force from the fork plus the friction force, whichever way the friction force is going, has to be a vector to the right. Now the problem is that we don't know how big that force is from the fork. So the fact that the horizontal component of the fork plus the friction add up to something to the right doesn't tell us really how big that friction is or how, which, even which direction that friction is, right? There's, you can have friction either going to the left or to the right and still get the sum to be to the right if we don't know what that fork force is. So we're kind of stuck, right? We're stuck because we can't isolate the friction force. So I'm thinking that this, that this first expression up here is not going to help us answer the question on the table. All right, so let's rethink this a bit. So the first expression that didn't really help us very much was the one that referred to the acceleration of the center of mass, right? It refers to the acceleration of just one point on the body. These other expressions we have deal with moments. So they deal with how the body actually rotates. In this case, how the wheel rolls without slipping, right? It's the friction force acting on the bottom of the wheel that prevents that slipping. So let's think about that for a second. So we have three different ways of writing a moment equation here. The first one is the most complex one. Let's, let's skip that one for a second. The next one, we're taking moments about some point P, 
But in this case, P has to be some point that's fixed. Fixed means stationary, not moving. And I think every point on this wheel is moving, right? At one instant, at any instant, the bottom of the wheel has zero velocity. But that bottom of the wheel, that point on the wheel that's touching the ground, just an instant later, it's going to lift right off the ground, right? So it's really not, it's, it's not stationary either. There's nothing stationary on this wheel. So I don't think we can use the, 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 the moment equation for a fixed point. So let's think about the last one here. Here we have uh, an expression involving the moments about the center of mass, right? Recall the center of mass for the wheel is the center of the wheel. So let's think about the moments of all these forces about the center mass, and we'll go through these in order right here. So here's D, that's the force from the fork. That acts through the center mass, doesn't it? Yeah, so that produces no moment. And then we've got this weight. The weight is acts through the center of gravity, which coincides with the center mass, so that doesn't produce a moment either. And then finally, we have the normal force down here at the bottom. Again, it points directly through the center mass. So all these three yellow forces, have no moment whatsoever about the center mass. Uh, what did we say we wanted to do? We want to isolate the friction, right? So the only force which produces a moment is that friction force. So we're not sure yet whether that friction force goes to the right or to the left, so we're not sure whether this moment is going to be counterclockwise or clockwise, but there's going to be a moment here, a moment produced by a single force, the friction force. All right, so now let's think about what this moment does. What does a moment do? You can see it on the other side of this expression over here. A moment produces an angular acceleration. All right, so let's think about what this angular acceleration is. What, what is that thing, right? Well, let's think about what the wheel is doing. It's related to the rotation rate of the wheel, right? The wheel, if the bike is moving to the right, the wheel is rotating clockwise. So that means the angular acceleration is clockwise. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? The wheel is rotating clockwise, so therefore the angular acceleration is clockwise? No, that's bogus, bogus, bogus. Don't do that argument. The wheel rotating clockwise, that's a rotation rate, right? If the wheel is rotating clockwise, that's a measure of the angular velocity, right? I want angular acceleration. Angular acceleration is the time derivative of angular velocity. So it's angular velocity dot. So to determine what, how, where, what our angular acceleration is, we need to know how the angular velocity is changing in time. So let's think about this some more. As we mentioned just a moment ago, the angular velocity of the wheel, of the front wheel, is clockwise, right? But the bicycle is speeding up. It's going faster and faster. So therefore, the wheel rotation rate has to get faster and faster. The wheel rotation rate is getting bigger and bigger in the clockwise direction, if you will. So therefore, the rate of change of the angular velocity, the rate of change of that rotation rate is in the clockwise direction. Right, it would be a vector into the screen. All right, so let's regroup our thoughts again. We just argued that the angular acceleration must be clockwise. And that angular acceleration is clockwise because the angular velocity is clockwise and, and because this angular velocity is just getting bigger and bigger in this clockwise direction. And then what does that tell you? This tells me if these two sides have to be equal to each other, that means the moment also has to be counterclockwise. It has to be counterclockwise because it has to be in the same direction as the other side of the equation. When two vectors are equal, they're equal in direction as well. And there's the direction of our moment. So how do I get a, a clockwise moment? The only way we can get a clockwise moment is if this friction force is to the left. All right, does that make sense? Friction force to the left. Let let me actually um, let's see if I can just erase it up here. Yeah, there we go. So there's that friction force to the left, and it's important, right? This friction force 
is going to try to turn the wheel that direction around its around its hubs, right? So it's this clockwise moment the backward facing friction force delivers. It's the backwards moment that we need in order to cause this angular acceleration. In fact, I should have put the angular acceleration onto my uh, mass acceleration diagram. There's the IG alpha. Cool, so question number one, which direction does the friction force act on the wheels? Question number one, the front wheel, solved. All right, now I think we're ready to answer the question for the rear wheel, right? So how can we do the rear wheel? I'm going to ask you to pause the video again. I want you to think about the rear, rear wheel. Think about how you'd set this up. Think about what would be different, what would be the same. You take a few minutes. When you're ready, come back, right? Don't come back until you've at least thought through this, given this a lot of thought. All right, so to study the rear wheel, you might suggest doing something very similar to what we did with the front wheel, right? It looks like a very similar situation. Um, the forces are a little bit different though, right? So let's, um, let's uh, draw a new free body diagram. Let's get rid of the old free body diagram. The free body diagram, put in the new one. I think we get something like this. We still have a normal force. We still have a weight due to the wheel. Now the frame is coming in contact with, from a different direction. In fact, it's probably coming in from multiple directions, but I'm just drawing the, the direction like so. What really matters here is that the frame is acting on the hub itself, so it's not going to produce a moment about the hub, right? And so that just leaves the only force producing a moment, the friction, right? Forgot, did I say something about the normal force? Normal force is in there too. So all three of those yellow vectors um, produce no moment about the center, leaving only the friction. So it looks as though we're doing the exact same thing as we did with the front wheel, and we'll get the exact same answer as we had before. How does that sound? Yeah, done? Not so fast, not so fast. I'm missing something. I'm missing a force on the rear wheel. Can you see it? What's the force I'm missing? This is a real bicycle here. I've got a stick figure bicycle that might not be showing the whole picture, but think about a real bicycle. Is there something going on? So on a real bicycle, there is something to drive that rear wheel, right? And it looks maybe something kind of like this. We've got this front chain ring with some pedals attached to it. We've got a back sprocket right here attached to the rear rear wheel and there's a chain that wraps around both right you pedal the wheels it turns the the chain ring which pulls on the chain which turns the sprocket which gets the bicycle going and we miss that part in our free body diagram if I were to put that rear sprocket in there it looks something like this and then the force from the top chain you know and the force from the tension in the top chain would be some force that acts in that direction. The important thing to note is at this, this, I'll call it the chain tension force, the chain tension force does not act through the center of mass. It does not act through the hub. It, it's wrapped around the sprocket, which is very purposely offset from the hub. That's the what that's what creates your moment. That's what causes that's what that's what that is what provides this rotation torque to, to drive your wheel. And you might say there's also tension on the bottom part of the sprocket too, but that's a typically, you know, chains are typically kind of slack on the bottom. And guess what? Now we have a problem that we saw before. I've got the tension and the, the friction both producing a moment, and we don't know which one is going to win out, right? Which one's going to create the moment that we need. In fact, it looks like we need a moment. Ugh, looks like I put my angular acceleration in the wrong direction. Ugh. All right, that angular acceleration is going this way. Yeah, so to recap, I need these two forces, the friction force and the tension force in the chain, to somehow conspire in a way that produces a net uh, moment 
clockwise because I know my angular acceleration is going to be clockwise. The chain itself can produce that clockwise moment regardless of whether the friction force is forward or backward. So this again is not helping. We've got to go think a little bit harder, I guess, right? All right. So what are we going to do? Take a moment. If you if you if you got stuck here, take another moment to think about this. All right. So back to the drawing board. The, again, the confounding elements of this is this tension force. Now we have to solve for it if we're going to get to that friction, and I can't. This is at least I don't have enough information to do it. Um, and that. If I start taking moments about other points, then I'm going to have the normal force and the weight and, and the force from the frame also coming into this. So, ugh. so what do we do? I'd like to sort of try to get rid of some of these forces that I can't handle. And what I'm going to suggest is we do something we've done in previous problems, I think at least twice now already. So what I'm going to suggest doing Instead of considering the free body diagram of the back wheel to get that friction force, I'm going to suggest that we consider the free body diagram of the entire bicycle. All right, so this is what I get on my free body diagram for the entire bike. So just as before, we have normal forces acting at the wheel. So those are the, the vertical yellow uh, forces here. We've got the weight pulling straight down. Notice that the bicycle chain does not appear in my free body diagram. Why is that? Well, it's because it's an in, because it, it it is because it is an internal force, right? It's a force that that between the sprocket on the rear wheel and the chain ring which is attached to the frame, right? Internal. It's a force between objects within the body that you're considering. Uh, other forces that are internal would be the force of the rider pushing on the pedals. Right? If we include that's if we include the rider in this in this free body diagram as well, but let's do it. And I think that's it. These are all the external forces. Now we move over to the mass acceleration diagram. And what do we see or what are we expecting? This this frame should be if we're if we're applying Newton's second law or this equivalent to Newton's second law at the top, what goes on the right hand side is mass times the acceleration of the center of mass of the bike. So the center mass has an acceleration that's purely horizontal. So that means the vertical forces are going to cancel each other out. So all these yellow vectors are going to cancel each other out, just leaving the, the sort of orangey vectors right here. And these two orange vectors, the force, friction force on the rear wheel and the friction force on the front wheel, they have to add together. If we're going to have a bicycle that's accelerating, they're going to have to add to something in the i-hat direction. So there's no way that this rear friction force can be backwards, right? Because if the rear friction force were backwards, then I'd, I'd be adding two backwards forces together. I get a backwards force. I need a, f a force pointing forward. So therefore, the, the force on the rear wheel has to be pointed to the right, and it also has to be bigger in magnitude than the friction force on the front wheel. Whew. But they have to, these two forces have to add in a way that, that's equivalent to that mass times acceleration. So what I'm doing here is I've made some space so I can write out this physical principle again. And we're doing the F equals MA thing where A is the acceleration of center mass. The center, the accelerate, the center of mass we know is accelerating to the right. So with the sum of the forces, what do we get? We know that the vertical forces add up to zero, right? And that what, what I have left is one force, F, on the front wheel pulling back, pulling back, and then we have the back wheel. Which way is it going? Put something like this without an arrow on it. So this will be force on the rear wheel. And I need this vector, whichever way it's pointed, plus that vector, which is pointing backwards, to add up to this vector, which is pointing forwards. So I'm hoping that you see that these two vectors I add together, the, the force on the rear wheel, it has to be pointing to the right in order to get the result that we want, right? And it has to be bigger than the, than the uh, uh, friction force on the front wheel. So there's our answer right there. 
All right, so let's go back to the original problem statement and see where we are. So we were, we were asked to find the direction that friction acts on each of the wheels. This is friction from the ground. And we had found that the friction force acts on the front wheel by pulling towards the back. Pulling backward causes a moment on the front wheel, which gives it an angular velocity in the appropriate direction, right? As the, as the bicycle speeds up, the, wheel, the rotation rate of the wheel has to speed up as well. And we need a force from the ground in order to provide that moment to give it that, that angular acceleration. All right, and then what we did is we went to the back wheel. And going back to the back wheel, we find that the friction force on the back wheel acts in the forward direction. So let me do some erasing right here. So we've got some forward force from the ground, right? This is, this is the friction force is between the tire and the ground. So the ground is pulling or pushing the tire forward. And this is the, this is the force that propels the whole bicycle forward, right? It makes the bicycle itself have acceleration. And that ends our problem. Okay, now as you've, as you think about this problem, you, there's certain permutations I, I would suggest you think about. So, for example, what happened, what would happen if, uh, let's see, what if it was a front wheel drive bicycle, right? It's kind of hard to get a chain to go to the front wheel, but maybe it's an electric bike, right? It has an electric motor on the front wheel, and that's driving the, that's driving the bicycle. And then the, assume that the back wheel is just along for the ride. So in this case, well, how would the friction forces act on the wheels? Yeah, think about it. Or what if the bicycle is cruising around and slowing down? In particular, let's suppose we're slowing down by applying the brake to the back wheel, the rear wheel. Yeah, or what if we're slowing down by applying just the brake on the front wheel? Yeah, there's several permutations to the problem that are worthwhile looking into just to convince yourself that you understand how this thing works, and I encourage you to do so. Until next time, I'll catch you later.